But what happens after that first paragraph, you grab their attention where they go, whoa, this person knows something about this company. No one's ever said that exactly like that to me. In fact, my management team has never even said it that way. Right? So that's a clear differentiator. Then the second paragraph is really three bullet points of specific ideas as to how you're going to bring value to them. And for those of you who are employed and reapplying, or even if you, don't, you aren't asked to reapply, I'm suggesting you be proactive and do the same thing with your employer. Don't wait until you're on that list that the management committee's having a discussion on, should we keep Gordon or not? Because there's lots of those conversations going on right now, and you might be on that list, right? So I'm saying if you're proactive about this, even with your current employer, the same concept, you're presenting fresh thinking, new ideas that you're probably going to have a better chance of staying off that list. They're going to rethink you. Because you know what happens, and that's what these CEOs said to me all the time. So I said, so I don't know the name of your management team, but if I were to know the name and say, tell me what you think about Gordon Miller, what would you say? And they all said, well, I'd probably say, pretty valuable, kind of up to speed, doesn't really have new ideas good team player, good communicator, not sure they understand where the market's going. That's how they answered that question. So they know. So the idea of what I'm talking about here, a value proposition letter and or approach with your current employer is to help change that thinking because that's how they're looking at it right now, I guarantee you. I, I didn't talk to a CEO and I talked to hundreds of them all industries, all markets, small companies, medium-sized, large, all industries. And not one of them said, am I content with my current management team? Not one of them. Uh, forgive me for jumping ahead. Oh, please. But do you need two to 4,000 of these, like some people do? No. Okay. No, just like, and I'm getting sidetracked, but I think it's important here, just like you don't need 5.1 million level three LinkedIn connections like I have. <laughs> now, is LinkedIn not valuable? It is valuable. But if you understand where its value lies, then it's a good tool for you. But if you think just because, and I thought this, just because I now have amassed 5.1 million level threes, that voila, great things were gonna happen, I could get to anybody, I could do anything, not true. Not true. How did you get in to see all these CEOs? You know, it's the darndest thing. I, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, it's the darndest thing. What I didn't tell you was the hundreds of CEOs that wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> no. Right? Can you imagine? No. You're going to be right? joking, Gordon. You? Yeah. Who'd not want to talk to me, for gosh sakes? You know, Grandpa of Five, John Lennon fan. Who, who wouldn't want to talk to me? Lots of people. See, there was a bunch of CEOs who said, thank you, but no thanks. Because they're afraid that I'm going to misrepresent them in the book. And that does happen with writers. They do oftentimes sort of twist it and spin it a bit. So there was a lot of CEOs who said, no thank you. But the ones who said, I, I would be happy to have that conversation with you had, had kind of diverse reasons as to why they wanted to talk with me. I think some of them wanted their name in a book, right? They thought it might be brand building or recognition. Some of them had a passion about the topic and they wanted to communicate it. I'm not 100% clear. It's a little, it's a little uh, uh, confusing at times to me as to why they wouldn't want, wouldn't want to talk with me. But, they usually did. And oftentimes the publisher and the publicist at the publisher is pretty savvy in having that conversation. But they shared that information. And not one of them said they were content with their entire management team. Just out of curiosity, what was the uh, you say age and education level of the ones that would talk to you? Uh, of the CEOs? Mm -hmm. I would say uh, uh, 
90% of them were between 45 and 65 years old. Okay? Uh, many had graduate degrees, not all of them, but I'd say the majority did. And the majority of them had a pretty successful track record. Eighteen uh, percent. That number I do know. Women were more open to having this discussion. Women were more receptive to the idea of creative disruption. In general, there were exceptions, right? And maybe it's because a lot of the women that I spoke to who were CEOs had only been a CEO, and I say that lightly, only been a CEO of a company for less than 10 years or so. So maybe they weren't as hardwired as some of the men who had been a CEO for 25 years. Yes, ma'am? Did you notice any difference as far as the country, across the country? Yes. Yes, that's correct. East Coast was more traditional in thinking. West Coast was more forward thinking. And there were certainly uh, uh, people who were different than that from those regions. But in general, that's what it was. Chicago, for example, I talked to a half dozen or so uh, CEOs in the Chicago area, was really a mix. There was kind of both things going on there. So, but the thing I want, I'm, I'm, I'm saying here to you, whether you're employed or unemployed, the idea of creative disruption is how the CEO views it. And part of the reason I'm sharing this information is that you need to know that. They're looking for fresh ideas. Uh huh. Shows there's an equation, right? Right. Twenty so percent on top, yep. eighty percent on bottom. Right. Twenty percent of the people can think on top. Uh huh. Eighty percent is performance. So right. The rules perform. Right. The CEOs in the middle. Mm -hmm. Twenty CEOs the bottom. Right. All along, CEO managing the eighty percent. Uh huh. They collect the twenty percent. That's why the very clean companies are shaped they are now. You're right. You thinking here is the reverse of equation here, right? They start with attention to the twenty. Who can think, give ideas. Mm -hmm. So the top 20 cannot really make the idea work. Mm -hmm. Find different companies, start their own company or something. Mm -hmm. So because of the CEOs focus on reduce cost, lean manufacture, right. Six Sigma, right. instead of thinking something new right. to move the company forward. Right. So based on what you're saying is, it seems like it's changing. Shifting. It is shifting. There's no question. So and we then, start to focus on the top 20. In fact, what they said to me is it isn't just that 20%. They want to see fresh thinking from virtually everybody, right? Because they think that's what's going to give them the best chance for success, that it's pervasive within their organization. And I said, are you willing to make that kind of commitment to your culture? Right. Right. Is, yeah. They do say that they want this. Yes, yes. When you try to perform that yes, thing, of course. They do want of course, <laughs> absolutely. That is, that is totally valid and totally fair. In fact, I even confronted a few of those, hopefully diplomatically, uh, about that very situation. You know, I'm a little concerned. I spent, I personally spent 25 years in corporate America. I've got a little data to draw on here. I'm not just some author that's got these crazy ideas. Well, maybe I am. But, uh, and, and they said, well, I understand that. We were reluctant in the past, right? Now, whether they actually follow through on that is another bet, right? Maybe you get some odds in Vegas on that one. Do you think these CEOs will do? But I don't, I'm not sure about that. But I saw a, a true conviction from some of them anyway, and I'm not sure how well it represents every CEO in every city or hiring executive. But I saw some conviction there.